unsullied by us humans, sex is a very good part of human life. We live our lives in a great deal of hypocrisy, telling our children to do one thing while we do something else. The quest for control. We all would love it if our lives were a bit more controllable. Discussions within the Christian community about these questions will be primary for the survival of the Christian community. It now is a great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Dr. Ben Mitchell. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is a professor here at Trinity International University. He teaches in the areas of bioethics and contemporary culture in particular. He's a senior fellow of the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity and serves as, as editor, international editor of the uh, journal Ethics and Medicine. He is a bioethics consultant for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. He received his PhD in philosophy with a concentration in medical ethics at the University of Tennessee. He's done clinical ethics rotations at a number of institutions, including the University of Tennessee and Vanderbilt University. He pastored Southern Baptist churches for over 13 years. He's a prolific author and speaker. You're already beginning to see there are many different streams that flow together into this person uh, whom we know as Dr. Ben Mitchell. But a distinctive beyond all of that, and an important distinctive indeed, is that he's a man committed to God and to all that God has created and intends the world to be. He joins us tonight to address the question uh, the quest for immortality. Will you please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Ben Mitchell. Well, it's great to see you. This has become an annual meeting place for us all to not only, uh, as some were doing a moment ago, sharing war stories, but also uh, just for us to be able to enjoy uh, the fellowship one with another. Before I begin this evening, I need to uh, make a quick announcement. I've been asked to make a quick announcement that students in the bioethics institutes and anyone else who has not received uh, the cloning statement that you found in your packets uh, can pick those up at the registration desk. And uh, could you please encourage your colleagues to uh, take a look at the cloning statement, to reflect on it, and they'll find information about that at cbhd.org slash cloning. Um, so look for that. And then I mentioned to Dr. Grego um, about the poem that, that uh, some of you were interested in. Uh, if we can do so ethically because of copyright, uh, we can put that on the website and you can access it that way. Uh, so we, we will be happy to take your request, but if you don't, uh, think now to let us know or think in the days ahead to let us know, check the website and if we can put it up there, uh, we will do so. Life extension technologies and the quest for immortality. Contemporary medico-techno-futurists have made a fascinating find of late. For decades they've been pondering the possibilities and rehearsing the research and doing the discovering and what have they discovered? They've discovered that humans are immortal. Dr. Ben Bova, author of Immortality, How Science is Extending Your Lifespan and Changing the World, states triumphalistically, physical immortality is within sight. There are people living today who may extend their lifespans indefinitely. Even more intriguingly, he says, the first immortal beings are probably living among us today. I mean, look around, you might be one of them. These are men and women who may well be able to live for centuries, perhaps even extend their lifespans indefinitely. For them, death will not be inevitable. You may be one of the immortals, particularly if you're less than 50 years old in reasonable health and live a moderate lifestyle, you may live for centuries or longer, he says. 
what are we to make of claims like that? Should we rewrite re our wills? Should we go ahead and buy that 100-year watch that we've been looking at? Should we rethink retirement? Should we go back and get that second PhD, MD, JD, or all three, uh, depending on just how long we might have? This revolution in longevity has resulted in a mega shift in our thinking about aging and ethics. Some of you who've been at this a while will remember the pessimistic titles, the old standards, ethics in an aging society, too old for health care, a good old age. These sound so dull and lifeless when compared to immortality. It wasn't long ago that former Colorado Governor Richard Lamb declared that after 70 years, you'd used enough health care dollars and you should get out of the way and leave others to use those scarce medical resources. But think about it, if you had taken his advice and you live 100 or 150 or 200 years or maybe a century, that's a long time without health care. <laughs> we seem to have moved from an era of limiting health care to the threshold of limitless health. In fact, one of the fastest growing cottage industries in the world is aging research. But unlike the past generation of research that sought assiduously to reduce the problems associated with aging or to reduce the, the effects of aging, this generation of scientists is set on eradicating aging altogether. These new prolongivists, as they like to be called, are trying to prove Shakespeare's Henry IV wrong when he said, we owe God a death. In fact, they say there's nothing of the kind or there's, there's, uh, there is no such thing as owing God a death. Instead, they're trying to make Woody Allen a prophet who quipped in his typical Woody Allen style, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. He also famously said, it's not that I'm afraid to die, I just don't want to be there when it happens. If you're really convinced that you might live 100 more years, 250 more years, or century, the centuries, there's even a life extension foundation. Once you become a member, quote, you'll have access to a toll-free phone line where knowledgeable advisors can answer your questions and assist you in setting up an affordable life extension program designed to reduce your risk of degenerative disease and slow the rate at which you age. You'll find that at lef.org. What are the life extension technologists promising? How should we respond? Do we catch the age wave and enjoy our final, though feeble, last days? Or do we board the techno shuttle to endless life? One of the starkest features of aging, in fact its hallmark, is that the risk of falling ill and dying increases inexorably as we get older. This rather unwelcome principle was first cast into mathematical form in 1825 by Benjamin Gompertz, a pioneer in actuarial science. What Gompertz found was that like compound interest, adult mortality rates increase exponentially with age. In effect, your risk of dying doubles with every eight additional years you live. If Gompertz were alive today, he would find that this fundamental property hasn't altered, but that the overall level of death rates has, in fact, fallen. The most significant trends affecting longevity today are the unexpected and continuing declines in death rates of older people. As recently as 1900, life expectancy at birth for the average American male was only 48.3 years, for the average female, 51.1. And life expectancy in America was about as good as anywhere on earth. Childhood diseases, a lack of sanitation, and the accompanying infectious diseases like cholera and tuberculosis took the lives of many of our early 20th century kin. By the middle of the last century, life expectancy at birth had increased to 66 for males and 71.7 for females, representing a gain of 20 years increased life expectancy by the end of the century. 
Life expectancy at birth had risen to 75.7 years for the average American male and 82.7 for the average American female. Or to put it in even more grandiose sounding terms, men live nearly 28,000 days and women live nearly 30,000 days. In the United States, Great Britain, and other developed countries, life expectancy actually improves with age. It's likely, barring some major environmental catastrophe, that average life expectancy will continue to rise. In their recent and very helpful study, The Quest for Immortality, Science at the Frontiers of Aging, University of Chicago researchers Jay Olshansky and Bruce Carnes point out that these sanguine data did not occur by happenstance, but are the result of a revolution longevity revolutions, as they put it. The last longevity resolution, revolution uh, occurred at the turn of the 20th century, as we've already mentioned, where in 1900, 10 to 15 percent of all babies born in the United States died before reaching their first birthday, mostly from infectious diseases. And when life expectancy is 45, Someone who dies at 50 brings the average up a little bit and the death of an infant brings it down. If 10 to 15 percent of the population die as infants, life expectancy averages come down significantly. Say Olshansky and Carnes, adding 33 years to the life expectancy of the U.S. population over, over the course of the 20th century by saving the young was an achievement of monumental proportions. This achievement would, however, pale in comparison to the biomedical process, progress that would be required to make the same gain in life expectancy over the next 20, sorry, over the next century by extending the lives of older people, end quote. Well, how precisely might such a longevity revolution be brought about? How, how could the prolongivists actually make good on their prophecies? enter the genetic revolution. This year's prestigious and popular BBC Reef Lectures were given by gerontologist Tom Kirkwood, professor of medicine and head of gerontology at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne and author of the 1999 volume, Time of Our Lives, The Science of Human Aging. Interestingly enough, this year's lectures, the Reef Lectures, actually moved around the world so that the second lecture wasn't delivered in London, but in fact at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, uh, the Long Island Research Facility where James Watson has been doing genetic research for decades. Kirkwood reminds us that on June 26, 2000, the day the first draft of the human genome uh, was announced, then President Bill Clinton telephoned Prime Minister Tony Blair to congratulate him on the birth of his son Leo and to celebrate that, quote, Leo had, at a stroke, gained 25 years of life expectancy. That is to say, the advances in genetics are destined to multiply life expectancy. The bad news, says Kirkwood, is that your DNA is in trouble. The DNA in your body is taking damaging hits as we speak. The attack rate on DNA has been estimated at 10,000 damaging hits per cell per day. Since your body is composed of several trillion cells, the carnage is unimaginable. In fact, during this evening's meeting, you'll use up about one ten thousandth part of one percent of your life expectancy. Now, don't everyone panic and leave. That's not a lot, and you probably won't feel it except on that one part of your body right now. <laughs> but in fact, another grain of sand has passed through the hourglass of our lives as we sit here. The major culprit doing damage to our DNA is, as we're told, nothing less than oxygen. Those so-called free radicals, no doubt a term invented in the 1960s, those free radicals damaged our cells from within, an oxymoron, I might, uh, might uh, mention. Um, of course, toxins from without, like tobacco smoke and sunlight, are taking their toll, too. To make matters worse, we all suffer from genetic anomalies, some of them worse than others. Diabetes, cancer, and other diseases are linked to mutant genes. Not only might gene therapy one day treat these conditions, but some researchers believe that through genetic screening and careful mate selection, 
We can extend human life beyond present imaginations. Michael Rose, for instance, hypothesized that longevity could be extended through selective breeding. To test his hypothesis, Rose permitted only those fruit fly females that produce their eggs later in lifespan to contribute eggs for the next generation. In human terms, he said, this would be like selecting human females age 26 and older to be mothers and then only permitting the daughters who were fertile after age 26 to reproduce and so on for many generations. That way, only women capable of producing babies near maximum recorded age of menopause would be permitted to be mothers for the next generation. Well, his experiment was a success. Each generation of fruit flies lived a little longer than the previous one, and that's great news for fruit flies. <laughs> of course, Rose and others believe that if a similar experiment could be performed on humans, a measurable increase in life expectancy would be observed within 10 generations or within about 250 years. Now, as you might imagine, Rose has been dubbed the Lord of the Flies for his suggestion that, <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, the media dubbed him Lord of the Flies. And we already know about selective breeding programs, what those look like and why they're not good ethically, politically, um, or even historically. So if selective breeding isn't the way to longevity, what about embryonic stem cells and the cloning re revolution? Michael West, president and CEO of Advanced Cell Technology, hopes that human embryonic stem cell research combined with cloning technology will lead to the next longevity re revolution. In April 28, 2000, in the uh, uh, journal Science, West and his colleagues reported that cloning technology may reverse cellular aging through so-called therapeutic cloning, uh, language I would challenge, but through so-called therapeutic cloning, West believes that our decrepit cells can be replaced by more youthful cell cells. Cloning those cells would avoid the problem of tissue rejection, which presents such a formidable challenge to other forms of transplantation. Of course, the research subjects in these experiments are human embryos whose stem cells must be harvested for the research, resulting in the death of the embryo or whose embryonic self must be cloned for the purposes of vivisection and cellular transfer. In an interview published by the Life Extension Foundation, West was asked about the moral status of the early human embryo. And when asked about therapeutic cloning and whether or not it was morally problematic, West said, quote, what we're proposing as an ethical and moral use of cloning technology in the arena of human medicine is the creation of microscopic balls of cells called blastocysts. These are aggregates of about 100 cells that exist up to about 14 days of development. At 14 days, small aggregations of cells begin to individualize. By that, we mean the cells begin to become various cells and tissues of the body, or they've committed themselves to become an individual human being prior to day 14, the small ball of cells can still become two individual human beings. They can become identical twins, and indeed that's how identical twins form. The small ball of cells divides into two. So prior to 14 days, this small ball of cells has not individualized. It's not decided to become one individual or two individuals. And so he goes on, so because they've not uh, individualized, they've not committed to becoming a person. And because there's no person there, and there are no differentiated cells of any kind, the blastocyst is often called a pre-embryo to distinguish it from an embryo which is committed to becoming a given individual." End quote. Dr. West's optimistic characterization of human cloning and his typical certainty about the moral status of the human embryo are unconvincing. First, just because we cannot tell yet that the early blastocyst is not being directed to become an individual doesn't mean that the blastocyst has not already been directed to become an individual. It just means we haven't discovered the mechanism yet. Second, just because by our lights we cannot tell whether the blastocyst will produce one or two persons through twinning doesn't mean there's, as he says, no person there. He even, he even admits as much when he says, well, you might end up with two persons through twinning. So we could say that at the blastocyst stage, instead of saying there's no person there, we could say there is at least one person there. 
So double homicide doesn't seem to be a helpful way to make his argument work. <laughs> Finally, Dr. West is increasingly being left behind by his colleagues in developmental embryology who cease to use the term pre-embryo because they recognize it has more political than, that, that it is more politically than biologically correct. Then, and, and I'm sure if he were here, he would say this about me. Then Dr. West leaves his discipline and turns theologian. He says, there's nothing in the Bible that you could bring as evidence that, that life begins with a fertilized egg. It's more an aesthetic preference, the sense that life should begin with a compassionate and loving act of making love, not with some stranger inserting a sperm head through the zona pellucida into a, an oocyte under a microscope and culturing in a CO2 incubator. He goes on, what I think we need to do as a society is grow up. We're living in an age where it's in our power to do good, to alleviate human suffering, and we need to be mature and use our discoveries to make the world a better place. And where Dr. West here, I would say, even if it means cannibalizing our offspring. Other technologies of regenerative medicine are championed to increase longevity, like melatonin therapy, human growth hormone, robotics and prostheses, nanotechnology, and if all else fails, cryonics. We'll freeze you in liquid nitrogen until we can sort out all this aging stuff. Again, in his wreath lectures, Tom Kirkwood says, it's fortunate, but by no means coincidental, that the revolution in longevity is accompanied by an equally unprecedented, uh, unprecedented revolution in the life sciences. That is to say that life extension technology is one with the biotechnology revolution, not only, on part, uh, not only in part on the merits of the technology itself, but I would urge also because baby boomers fear growing old more than nearly anything. This isn't the way it used to be. I should mention at this point that there have been exceptions to today's average human lifespan. Moses, the author of Psalm 90, declared, the length of our days is 70 years or 80, if we have the strength, yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. But Moses never meant to say that no one ever lived longer than 80 years. In fact, Moses himself, according to the testimony of, of Scripture, lived to be 120. Methuselah's age is given as 969 years, Noah 950, and even if, as some commentators suggest, those numbers were really to be measured in months, the lifespan is still utterly remarkable. Methuselah would have been 81, Noah slightly over 70. In an age when most people didn't live to see 30, those are astonishing lifespans. In 1997, the world record for a reliably documented lifespan was extended spectacularly by Jean Calment, a French woman who died at the remarkable age of 122 years and five months. All of this is to argue that attempts to extend one's life or to extend the lives of the entire human community are not intrinsically wrong. The question is a means end question. Are, are the means to get to the goal morally acceptable? Moreover, there's an important telos or purpose question. It's fairly clear to me not only that there's nothing intrinsically wrong with applying life extension technologies in an effort to extend human lifespan, there's also nothing intrinsically right about extending human lifespan, especially in a narcissistic, avaricious, and, a, 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 and equiv a, acquisitive age like ours. Why would we want some people to live longer? <laughs> to live better, yes, but not necessarily to live longer. In fact, in, in fact living better may help you live longer. In, a, in, in, in what is really a, an exciting study found in the volume Aging with Grace, what the Nun study teaches us about lead, uh, leading longer, healthier, and more meaningful lives, David Snowden chronicles a 25-year longitudinal Alzheimer study of 678 Catholic sisters of Notre Dame. Snowden and colleagues found, for example, that a history of stroke and head trauma can uh, boost your chances of coming down with Alzheimer's later in life. They found that a college education and an active intellectual life may actually protect you from Alzheimer's disease. 
Some of you should be very happy we're providing that therapy for you even as we speak. Even more interesting is their finding that the sisters who had expressed the most positive emotions in their writing as girls, writing letters and, and diaries and journals when they were girls, those who had expressed the most positive emotions during that period in their lives actually ended up living the longest and that those on the road to Alzheimer's expressed fewer and fewer positive emotions as their mental functions declined. Now Snowden and colleagues are under no illusions. They admit right up front that the mechanism behind these kinds of findings are notoriously difficult to tease out and nevertheless they have to, to also be honest with the data they've gathered. If you want to lead a long life and avoid as much as possible the risks, fa risk factors of Alzheimer's or for Alzheimer's, you should observe the following low-tech recommendations. One, protect your head from injury both within and without. Wear a helmet when bike riding, buckle your seat belt, reduce your risk for stroke by quitting smoking, exercising regularly, and keeping your blood pressure down. Two, stay in school. The more education you get, formal and informal, the less likely you are to get Alzheimer's. Three, learn a new skill. Keep exercising your mental muscle, they say, by learning how to do something new. Four, eat smart. One of the strongest findings of the Nunn study was that the link between folic, was the link between folic acid and mental health. A, a healthy brain requires adequate levels of folic acid. Five, stay connected with family. Seniors who remain engaged with family or community groups take longer to show signs of Alzheimer's than those who spend their days alone. And then even this is a low-tech uh, recommendation. Sixth, know your genetic susceptibility. That is, if there's Alzheimer's in your family, um, you don't throw up your hands and say, Alzheimer's, here I come. But you can begin to take the other appropriate precautions that might stave off the symptoms of Alzheimer's for as long as possible. Now, all of this, both the observation that I, I uh, would like to be able to defend, that there's nothing intrinsically wrong uh, in and of themselves with life extension technology, granted that the other ethical parameters surrounding a particular technology are, are within the ranges that we find morally acceptable. And two, the fact that we uh, uh, live, some of us, I should say, live longer than others and that there's a history of lifespans that are longer than even present lifespans. Both of those are hopeful signs and point us in the direction of uh, prosecuting uh, uh, these technologies, of using these technologies as we are able. After all, homo sapiens, human beings, homo sapiens are also fabricators, makers, homo faber. However, why, why immortality, why not mortality? Committee on Social Thought professor at the University of Chicago, Leon Cass, has just published a wonderful essay that I commend to you titled, L'Chaim, that is, to life, the, the, the toast to life and its limits, why not immortality? In part of the essay, Cass asks, what if mortality is not an evil? What if death, what if dying is not an evil? Perhaps it's even a blessing not only for the welfare of the community, but even for us as individuals. How could that be? How could it be that death could be a blessing rather than an intrinsic evil? Cass says, I, I wish to make the case for the virtues of mortali uh, mortality. For to argue that human life would be better without death is, I submit, to argue that human life would be better being something other than human. How then might our finitude be good for us? He says, I offer four benefits, first among which, four benefits of mortality, first among which is interest and engagement. If the human lifespan were increased even by only 20 years, would the pleasures of life increase proportionally? I remember sitting down with, this is not Cass, this is me, I remember sitting down with my 92-year-old grandmother, sweet and had raised me as uh, if I were her son. And I asked her, um, 
Nanny, do you, do you want to live forever? I think I even said, don't you want to live forever? And she took me to be asking the question, don't you want to live forever in this uh, mortal coil, as, as it were? And she said, and she looked right in my eyes, and she said, no, I've seen enough, I've done enough, I've had enough of this old world. She wasn't depressed. She was being realistic. And she was tired, not physically, not emotionally, but soulishly. She was tired of this life in the depth of her being. Cass goes on, if human lifespan were increased by 25 years, would professional tennis players really enjoy playing tennis 25% uh, playing 25% playing, uh, uh, more games of tennis, would they really? Would Don Juans of our world feel better for having seduced 1,250 women rather than just 1,000? Would they really? In fact, within the Christian worldview framework, within a Christian worldview perspective, one could argue convincingly that immort immortality in a fallen world would be a kind of hell. That to live in this mortal coil, in this world of darkness with its bright spots admitted, to live within this world would be a kind of hell. If you haven't seen Bicentennial Man, rent it. It's not a great movie, but it's a great um, thought experiment. The second reason Cass challenges us, the second reason for our finitude is um, that our finitude is a blessing is seriousness and aspiration. He asks, could life be serious and meaningful without the limit of mortality? Now think about that a minute. Could life be serious or meaningful without the limit of mortality? Isn't the limit of our time the ground for taking our lives seriously? The psalmist puts it this way, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to remember that our days are brief so that we might apply ourselves to wisdom. Our finitude becomes an impetus for our goals, prodding us to focus our aim and to work expeditiously toward those goals. Without knowing that I was going to have to deliver this paper tonight, I never would have completed it. <laughs> it adds seriousness and aspiration and perspiration tonight. <laughs> the third blessing of our mortality is beauty and love, says Cass. Perhaps the most beautiful is most radiant partly because we know it's fleeting and momentary. Perhaps the reason we say that is absolutely beautiful is because we know that it won't be with us long. And our aesthetic sensibilities capture that moment in our imaginations. How deeply, ask Cass, could one deathless human being love another? My own question is, who would agree to marriage when till death us do part might mean 500 years? <laughs> His question's actually better, but, but you can imagine what, what uh, a revolution in marriage law would result if 500 years were the lifespan. Where's Sam Casey? There's a job for you, Sam. Fourth. He says, there is the peculiarly human beauty of character, virtue and moral excellence. Those are, the, those are likewise the blessings of our finitude, virtue and moral excellence. To be mortal means to be able to give one's life sacrificially and heroically. Without mortality, the giving of one's life would be meaningless. 
We spend, Cass argues, the precious coinage of our lives for the sake of the noble and the good and the holy. And then hauntingly, he says, the immortals cannot be noble. Well, there is immortality, and there's immortality. And one of my favorite passages of Scripture has become that passage in the Apostles' second letter to the Corinthians, a passage written in a context of, of uh, deep anxiety in the Apostles' heart and mind. He's not only been disparaged and rejected, his apostleship has been rejected, but even more importantly to him, the gospel that he preaches has been repudiated. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in light of these daunting challenges, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. For Paul to say our light and momentary troubles in the light of his history uh, is to eradicate all complaining from our lives. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, pardon me, eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now we know, this is chapter 5, now, now we know that if our earthly tent, this tent we live in, is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. He says, we live in a body, this earthly tent that is corruptible and is uh, subject to all the pangs and problems of our mortality. But we know at the same time that we have a building, not, a, not just a tent, not just a tabernacle, not just a temporary place, but we have a durable building, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. And then he says, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Meanwhile, we groan. Longevity research and its progress notwithstanding, meanwhile, we will groan. Even if my knees felt better, even if I weren't having to wear glasses to read the fine print now, even if um, I, I weren't subject to all of the problems associated with midlife, I would groan. I would groan because of the issues our nation is facing right now. I would groan because my loved ones are hurting right now. I would groan because I see men and women, boys and girls who are on paths of self-destruction. I would groan because we live in a world that is not yet perfect. It's fallen. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we're clothed, we'll not be found naked. And when I first read that, I thought this is just Paul alluding to the obvious. If you're clothed, you won't be naked. But you remember who was last found naked in Holy Scripture? Adam and Eve and their guilt. We would not be found naked, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. There it is again. We groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling 
so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it's God who has made us for this very purpose. As we think about life extension technologies and all the wondrous things they might bring about, and there may be wonderful technologies yet to come, we also have to remember that we've been made for a purpose, for this very purpose, not not only for life in this tent, but for life eternal with the living God. We live by faith, not by sight, he says. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body read, whether we have life extension technologies or not, or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In that one passage, the Apostle Paul reminds us that we are mortal, and Cass reminds us that there are benefits to our mortality and so strive as we might to extend our lives and to extend the quality of life within those moral and ethical boundaries that we uh, have received from uh, God's revelation, from his word. Strive as we might, we re we're reminded that we are yet, yet purposed, destined for something beyond this something much greater than this, something much more glorious than this. And so my conclusion to the prospect of life extension technologies is that life extension technologies within the boundaries of virtue and holiness are not evil in and of themselves so long as they're not meant to make us miss life itself or the one whom to know is life itself. Thank you. Questions? Those who have questions, why don't you make your way up to the microphone? We'll, uh, we have some time for our questions, uh, dialogue here. In fact, I'll uh, let you uh, respond to questions as people come up, but uh, while people are formulating their questions, I'll go ahead and, and raise one to uh, okay. get the process going. Uh, in raising the issue of uh, viewing death as something perhaps that we should be less concerned about in an antagonistic sort of way, that there's, uh, there's some benefit to mortality, of course, there's a whole other discuss discussion surrounding death, which says that we need to be careful not to get too, too friendly toward it, or it begins to predispose us toward assisted suicide and euthanasia and whatever. So a, a healthy sense of, of death as an enemy or whatever um, is, a, is a safeguard there. How, how, would, how would you put those two together? Yeah, yeah, that, that's very, very uh, important to balance uh, some of the, the concerns. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we take death seriously, and uh, at one and the same time, realize from a again from a Christian worldview perspective, we realize that it is uh, an enemy in one sense, uh, uh, but that its sting um, is the most grievous of our enemies, and that sting has been conquered by the one who has, um, uh, through his sacrifice and resurrection, uh, defeated. Uh, death and its sting. So certainly within the context of uh, our purpose, uh, this purpose that Paul speaks of, um, we would not, and, and the, the parameters that God has established, we would not seek to hasten our death. At the same time, we ought not. In fact, the writer to the Hebrews says that we have been delivered from the fear of death through the one who has conquered death. That's an amazing passage, delivered, through the, delivered from the fear of death. He doesn't say that we've been delivered from death or even from, from, from fearing the dying process. 
Uh, there are lots of things about the dying process that I can imagine going through that I, I'm not looking forward to. But there's a difference in, in fearing the process and fearing death itself. Um, so I, I, there, there, I don't think anything that I said would, would argue that we ought to um, increase, uh, sorry, that we ought to um, 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 push for death um, or argue for assisted suicide or euthanasia. But we also ought to have, um, um, we, we also ought to be able to celebrate the fact that death is not our uh, master. Um, ben, I guess we really wouldn't want um, to push immortality unless we also had the fountain of youth. You know, that we wouldn't want 20 or 30 more years if our health wasn't good. What are we supposed to think about the fountain of youth? Well, of course, the, the technologies that I mentioned are, are thought to be the, the biotechnological fountain of youth. And, and you're right, even those who, who uh, are very optimistic about these technologies and those who are the, the uh, most fervent champions of these technologies uh, would argue that we're not just trying to prolong our days, but that we're also trying to prolong uh, the quality of life. And so it's not enough just to live 25 more years, but you want good, good function, uh, mentally, physically, uh, good function. So they think that many of these technologies will, will offer that, will offer not only length of days, but also offer better days. Uh, just to keep you from being asked by several people, do you have the reference on the cast essay? Yeah, it's uh, First Things, uh, the, the journal First Things, uh, about um, an issue or two ago. And as I recall, it's on the First Things website. You can down, I mean, you can just print it out. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I was wondering, uh, does, Dr., does Dr. Cass's article, is it speaking more to the secular mind and not the Christian mind? Because it would seem to me that those arguments that mortality is a driven is a driver for interest and engagement, seriousness and aspiration, and beauty and love, to the Christian heart and soul, uh, the prolongation or, or the joyful, vital prolongation of life would always give opportunity, no matter how long we live, because we're impelled by the desire for the glory of God, mm -hmm. and we're motivated by the residence of the Holy Spirit within. So I was just wondering, Dr. Castor, it's fascinating, but. It, what, what did he say yes, there? Or yes, thank you. Um, uh, yes, Dr. Cass would not make a Christian argument since he's Jewish. Um, uh, but um, he, he, and he is making the argument. In fact, there was a paper that was uh, delivered uh, at a conference in Jerusalem. Um, and he wasn't making a Christian argument. But your point is well taken that um, while uh, those are arguments that one could make and hopefully would be somewhat persuasive to any audience, um, the Christian gospel and the Christian worldview offers even more uh, because our lives are, are to redound whatever we do, the apostle says, to the glory of God. And not only that, but quite apart from all of those wonderful blessings of mortality, as, as Cass puts it, all of those blessings of mortality, um, we also share both the knowledge of the living God through Christ and the reality that we are known intimately by Him. And that, that uh, transcends even all those other wonderful benefits of mortality. That's a, that's a very helpful point, very correct point. Yes. Hi, you're talking about these various um, prognostications or aspirations to lengthen life. And I remember in a bioethics class I took, we were talking about various freezing procedures that have been proposed. Even this one group that uh, commercially offers um, opportunities to be frozen and uh, later vivified again. To what extent do these things lie in the realm of science fiction? To what extent is there um, real progress being made towards furthering uh, these goals? And what are your thoughts with 
respect to that in your research? Thank you. I, I want to be somewhat modest because this isn't my area. Uh, I'm, I'm not a cryogenics uh, uh, researcher uh, nor um, uh, a human physiologist, so I, I want to be somewhat modest. But, um, uh, and I also would like to say that I could use a cryogenics lab right now myself, but um, in any case, um, uh, there's, you know, it seems to me to be, to, there, there is, first of all, as far as I know, no one has ever been uh, revived from being frozen. In fact, most cryogenics labs that I, that I know anything about, um, or many cryogenics labs, uh, don't freeze the whole body anyway. They're freezing the head, um, which is another interesting metaphysical, ontological, uh, philosophical question is, do we really think that everything important about being human is in the head? Um, but they, they freeze the head in hopes that we might be able to revive the brain and then, you know, who knows what. Um, uh, but it seems to me there's a difference in wanting to prolong, as, as Nancy suggested, prolong quality of life. There's a difference between that and worshiping life. Finding life as the highest good. And um, those who opt for cryogenics, um, it seems to me, uh, uh, have have passed the, the threshold from wanting to live a, a life that is um, uh, a, a quality life that is, quality of life that is, is um, uh, joyful and and um, I don't want to say worth living but uh, you get my uh, understanding I hope but um, they have crossed the threshold to worshiping life. And it seems to me that, if, in fact, if you talk to most of those who would opt for that, it's because they don't believe there's anything beyond this life to hope for. Um, and, and if they're right, that this is all there is, then maybe you should freeze your head. <laughs> but if they're right and this is all there is, then we are of all people most miserable. I'm glad that you put it that way, the worship of life. And I think <clears throat> that as the church looks at the quest for immortality and we say that there are some boundaries and guidelines that we don't want to go across, that we also have to look at the spirit within ourselves and within the church that is worshiping life and youth and has stepped away from embracing the aging and the dying and making that part of our Christian experience. And what examples or what recommendations would you give? Because most youth groups, that's not one of the things that we teach them. We don't teach them to value those experiences or even to see what God's doing during that time. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I think you're exactly right. Uh, once significant life extension technologies are online, I would expect members of our churches to line up. I'll be next, thank you. Um, because I, I'm not sure that we have taught immortality as carefully and, and um, robustly as we ought. We don't have to wait for immortality technology. We have immortality. And yet, it's something that we don't hear addressed uh, very often from our pulpits or our Bible study uh, lecterns um, or even in our institutions. When was the last time you heard anyone talk about the afterlife? Never mind hell. When did you ever hear, when was the last time you heard somebody talk about heaven? And yet, Paul, as Paul said in, in this text, it was for this very purpose that we were created. Now, there's a wonderful book by Chip Conyers, A.J. Conyers, The Eclipse of Heaven, that you ought to get and read, and, and if you're in ministry, you ought to preach it. I mean, just, just say, I'm preaching Chip Conyers today, and just preach it. The Eclipse of Heaven. We have lost sight of the future that God has given us, um, and I think it's because... I think it's because 
we have things too easy. And my, my, my basis for saying that is that in the most wonderful passage on the future that I know of in Scripture, other than maybe the, that uh, description in Revelation of what heaven might be like, the most wonderful passage of the hope of the future um, that I uh, uh, often appeal to is the passage in Peter where Peter writes to a people who have lost everything those strangers scattered abroad who left with just the, the things they could carry because of the persecution that was surrounding them. And Peter says to those people who have lost everything, he says, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's very odd news for someone who's lost everything. Praise isn't the way you usually start your, your discussion. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That is, we have been purchased and promised an inheritance that will never be eradicated, never be corrupted, never fade away, well, how do I know I'm going to enjoy it? Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. We know that we will inherit that, that uh, uh, treasure that has been laid up for us because we are being kept by the power of God. Now listen to this. In this you greatly rejoice... In what? In this reality of uh, heaven, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I'm not wishing for trials, but I'm afraid that our hope of heaven uh, uh, has not been tempered by the fiery trials that, that uh, birthed this hope in the heart of the Apostle Peter. When those trials come, and, it's, and, and you, you mentioned young people, when young people lose one of their peers in a car wreck, when those trials come, that's when the hope of heaven, the hope of life Im, immortal, uh, becomes real and uh, becomes um, comforting and we could wish would become even palpable in our experience. So. Um, while I don't wish for trials, perhaps our hope of glory would be more vivid um, if we were really not doing quite as well as we, most of us, are doing. Thank you.